Actually, I snuck in a third case. I, I was pretty bad, which hopefully they won't, I won't get into too much trouble. But essentially, you know, during our case presentations, myself and my colleagues, we kind of took different topics with CLL patients. Um, I took uh, treatment naive older individuals uh, with CLL. So we looked at a patient who had comorbid illnesses, but also uh, was a TP53 mutated patient and an unmutated IGHV. So essentially, I kind of highlighted data looking at how to treat individuals in that scenario. And so we actually updated, given the updated data with Resonate 2, so right, so a Brutinib versus Chlorambucil, looking at that nice, you know, seven year follow up with a very nice progression free survival for patients at seven years. Very encouraging data, sort of shows, highlights sort of the efficacy there in treatment naive patients who are older. Um, and in addition, with patients who are started on a BTK inhibitor, it was like the, the nice long follow up to suggest that patients who maintain therapy over time, their responses also increase over time. So complete remissions typically when you start a BTK inhibitor are usually in the single digits. Um, but now we were seeing, you know, patients who, uh, you know, seven years, their their complete remission response increases to like 34 percent. So, again, sort of highlighting some of that data. Um, you know, that long term data. In addition, uh, I also highlighted a little bit about because these were all updates at the recent Congresses, updates with Elevate TN. So looking at a calibrutinib plus or minus obinutuzumab versus chlorambucil and obinutuzumab. And again, so favoring the acalabrutinib arms with a very, very nice PFS. Um, so again, highlighting how BTK inhibitors do really, really well for patients who are older, maybe with comorbidities, who are treatment naive. And if they have high risk features, so the case I did was a gentleman with a TP53 mutation, you know, we tend to favor BTK inhibitors because we have the longest data and really they've done so well. The, you know, the TP53 or the 17P deleted patients really have done well with BTK inhibitor based therapy. Um, looking again at an older individual, I also discussed a little bit about CLL14, so venetoclax and obinutuzumab. Uh, versus uh, obinutuzumab and chlorambucil, and again, highlighting how well patients do with venetoclax and obinutuzumab in that setting. Um, the PFS data, uh, not as robust for patients with TP53 or deleted 17P. So, so uh, you know, I kind of highlighted that many of us still recommend a BTK inhibitor uh, based therapy, but really nice data. So our older patients who are treatment naive really have, you know, can choose from BTK inhibitor based therapy versus venetoclax, obinutuzumab. Um, and obviously comorbidities will come into play. So depending upon what, you know, what comorbidities your older patient may have, you might select, you know, if they have cardiac issues, you might select venetoclax. If they have renal issues, you might go with a BTK inhibitor, but really highlighting more robust long term follow up data from some of these studies like Resonate 2 and Elevate TN and the CLL 14 data. So that was the that was some of the cases that I highlighted for treatment naive older individual. And then I also snuck in a little case there that looked at um, a, a younger. It's probably irrelevant, doesn't matter about the age, but a younger gentleman who was already on a BTK inhibitor. Um, and doing well, but then had evidence of progressive disease after four years being on therapy. And so I think with longer data since Abrutinib was first to market and we've had that since 2013, you know, now we're starting to see BTK resistant mutations. And so I highlighted a little bit about resistant mutations, uh, you know, having a BTK C481S mutation, PLC gamma 2 mutations, uh, you know, the development of these resistant mutations is starting to emerge. Um, and we have now some data about what to do about those individuals. So one, the most experience that we have is utilizing venetoclax in this scenario. Um, so we have data with venetoclax for patients who are, have become resistant to a BTK. And then, of course, we have some newer agents. We have the non-covalent BTK inhibitors such as pertubrutinib and others coming down the pike that are being evaluated um, with some some of that data that was presented at ASH and some of the recent Congresses at ASCO and EHA, really suggesting that some of these non-covalent BTK inhibitors can salvage patients who develop a BTK resistant mutation or even who have had venetoclax and were resistant to venetoclax. So alternative options of therapy highlighting for patients who, again, might have developed a BTK resistant mutation. So those are the those are the cases and, and what I focused on.